so please do keep an eye on your emails as we announce more details. I'd like to extend another huge thank you to EQC, who are partnering with NZSCE to deliver this webinar series. And I'd also like to extend a major a thanks to our major sponsors, ND Building Performance, as well as the support of Taylor Devices, Geostabilization International, Mainmark, Granol Rubber and Engineering, and Quake Core for their support of the webinar series. I'm delighted to say that we've now finalised the published proceedings for the papers for the 2020 conference. These will have come out via uh, email to all conference registrants uh, earlier today, and we'll also be going out to all NTSC members later today. Well, we offered two publication op op options to authors when they submitted their papers to the conference. The first was that papers would be provided to conference registrants and NCC members, and also published online on the NCC repository. The second option was that papers would be provided only to conference registrants and NCC members, but not included in the open access online publication. As such, the paper index that is included in the proceedings email includes hyperlinks to either the NZDCE repository or to a Dropbox folder, depending upon the author consent statement. However, all papers are hyperlinked within that reference index document, the PDF that's attached to the email, and the, the hyperlinks go to their respective locations. So you might not even notice the difference in paper location in the index. There's also a download link included within the email, whereby you can download a, a virtual USB that includes all the papers and their corresponding paper index in a single zip file. So we hope that you enjoy perusing the great work of the many authors that have published their work in our proceedings, and those um, many of those authors who sadly did not get the opportunity to present their paper in person due to the conference cancellation. So that's uh, um, it for me in terms of the formalities with regard to the conference. Uh, reminder today during the webinar, we will be using Pigeonhole to manage questions that arise. Uh, it's a separate system for Adobe Connect that's hosted in the webinar and can be opened in a, a smartphone or a browser on your computer. So even if you don't have a question, it does give, the give, give you the opportunity to ask questions, um, of, to, to vote for questions asked by others. So the address is just directly below me on the screen there. So that's it for me regarding formalities. I'll now pass it over to Helen and Joe, who will co-chair this webinar today. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, kia ora koutou kata. As well as providing insurance, EQC works really hard to reduce the impacts of disasters before they happen through our research, risk reduction and resilience program. We're particularly interested in where we build and how we build and have a goal of seeing stronger homes on better land. We engage in a variety of areas to this end and please feel free to contact me and the team anytime in that regard. Um, but I truly think that the emergence and growing prominence of the low damage design philosophy is one of the most exciting and promising things happening in engineering and resilience right now. Um, you know, we saw in the Canterbury earthquake sequence how many buildings weren't repairable or it wasn't cost effective to do so. We need to do everything possible in the smartest way possible to avoid that situation in the future. So we're very keen at EQC to support the development and practice of low damage design in New Zealand and we're particularly happy to support this webinar series. Um, a very big thank you to the NZSEE for arranging it and done an amazing job in setting it all up. Thank you to today's speakers um, and I'll pass over to Helen now. Thank you Jo and welcome everyone to this um, our fifth in the series of this webinar series. It's going to be a most interesting webinar today. Um, low damage design is a topic that is coming up a lot um, and there's significant work happening in this space. Um, the low damage design project is a piece of work that's happening in New Zealand right now. It's being funded by NB and is now well advanced and their guide is expected to be published early next year, so watch the space. This guide is aimed towards both building owners and designers and it will provide a briefing tool to help clients communicate to their design teams the building use requirements following an earthquake and that will inform site selection, structural and non-structural design and can include considerations of safety and well-being, business continuity, sustainability and community resilience as well as content protection and it will also provide a 
a reflected brief in tool for designers to assist in communicating back to the client in clear and simple terms how the building design options meet the client's needs. The aim is that this conversation will help create a shared understanding and where options and trade-offs can be discussed in terms of whole building performance. I'm sure it's going to be a valuable guide, so watch the space. And contact us in case you want to know more about it at Kaya at Engineering New Zealand, who's leading the project management of the project, and Hamish McKenzie, who's the project director. A lot, and there's many across the industry involved. So in support of this initiative and effort in low damage design, this webinar has been prepared to focus on providing some examples of low damage design and approaches that are being used or have been used in recent years in, across the world as a way to further advance the conversation. So first I want to welcome David Ma, who several of you, are, some of you may know already, and he'll be presenting to us his keynote from his offices in Berkeley, California. Unfortunately, his, our plans for him to present at the NZSE conference in person this year had to be modified to this online presentation system due to the current pandemic. We hope to welcome David back to New Zealand in future years, as soon as we can get this pandemic so that travel can happen again. So David is going to talk about and present on a low damage design approach he used for a community housing project in San Francisco recently, a project where the aim was to develop to deliver a low damage design for a vulnerable community group at no cost premium compared with the conventional design. You ask, is this possible? This project was awarded a US Resiliency Council gold rating, so I suspect that will become clearer when David talks to us that it is actually possible to do this. And listen out too for the New Zealand connection and the design solution. David's presentation will be followed by Alistair Catnack and Rowan Bella, who will jointly present three base isolated building projects that have recently been designed in Wellington. And I'll start with the perspective of client expectations and their drivers for base isolation, and then focus on their experience on using the new NZSE base isolation guidelines. And we'll conclude with how they communicated low damage detailing to the design and construction teams. I'm sure it'll be a fascinating presentation. And following the conclusion of both presentations, there'll be an opportunity for questions, at which Joe and I will chair. And similar to the previous webinars, we'll be using pigeonhole for people to pose questions and vote up the questions that they find most interesting. I encourage you to add questions to pigeonhole as the, pro as the presentations progress. Now I'd like to, to join with you and invite David to start his presentation. David, David, I think you have to get your, um, you have to go off mute. Can you hear me now? Helen, can you hear me now? No. Yes, thank you. Okay, right. good, good. Start again. Um, thank you, I'm super excited to present and I, I wish I were there in person, um, especially because you guys have seems to have beat the virus and you have a better government and you just seem smarter than us over here. So, um, but with that, uh, we'll jump in. Um, I'm gonna talk about, uh, my, the title of my talk is Designing a Seism Seismically Resilient Future. And I'm excited that um, as a community, a global community, uh, New Zealanders, uh, Californians, um, folks all over the world, that, that we can figure this out and I'm excited by the innovation in this space and all the great work that's going on in the exchange between um, the, the earthquake community. So let me jump right into it. I'm going to present um, six chapters. I'm just gonna start with context and then um, talk about um, some resilience and then eventually get to low cost resilience, which will be the, 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 the end of the talk. So first, um, in terms of context, I think what Helen said was, was, was a great lead-in. Uh, this graphic is something I use a lot. It, it's, it's really helpful where 
or a structural engineer, myself uh, especially included, to see that structures are only a part of the picture of what a whole building is. Um, in terms of value, I use the rule of thumb that a structure is worth 25% of the building, but we have a great leverage on the other 75% of the building. So when we think about resilience and design and what's important to everybody else, it's really um, critical to see the whole building rather than just the structure. This is a graphic that I developed for FEMA. FEMA is the uh, federal earthquake and management um, agency in the United States. And it's developed to facilitate a conversation with stakeholders about all the complex stuff in performance-based design, but doing it in a way that, that's simple and accessible. So we're not going to talk about like ductility and, and return periods, anything like that. Um, but it's clear graphics. First, we're talking about five different building types, each with better performance, from existing buildings to retrofitted buildings, all the way up to base isolated buildings, including code buildings and, um, and enhanced buildings. Uh, next. David, David, sorry to interrupt you again. There's a request coming through suggesting that it would be lovely to see you on your web camera while you're presenting. I'm not sure why that went off. I'll, I, I'm, so I'm there. Let's see. Hopefully it stays on. Um, there we go. Um, uh, so the next part is you see these images of what happens to these buildings with bigger earthquakes. The next component is the, the different features of safety. So how do different design choices affect safety? And I think as a community, uh, we should feel really proud that, that we've got the safety thing worked out with modern codes. I think we've, we've done a really great job. But in terms of stuff that everyone else, cl our clients really care about, uh, there's the issue of access. Can they get into their buildings after an earthquake? And here in the United States, we, we have a placarding system. Green means you can get in with unfettered access. Yellow means you can get in and get your laptop, but you got, can't stay. Uh, red means you can't even get in because it's too dangerous. And here you can see that depending on the type of building and the type of damage, that your, you, the, the chance of access uh, varies. Uh, the next issue is the, the repair clock, downtime. Um, and this goes from days to weeks to months to over a year. Uh, if you own a business or run a manufacturing facility, this is critical information so you can, so a, a stakeholder can know what they're getting with their building. Uh, next is the issue of cost. Uh, the green bags of money represent first cost. The, think of that as your investment or a stakeholder's investment into seismic performance. And the red bags of money represent future repair costs. And that's where it gets tricky because they may or may not happen, you know, probabilities and all of that stuff. But there's a basic trend where, where, where one could invest more and save money later. And then finally, there's the issue of the environmental impact. Uh, buildings take a lot of energy to create. And if, if they get damaged and you have to repair them again, um, you spend a lot of energy. So all of this is phrasing, framing the big picture for clients so they can understand what we're talking about in ways that affect them, in ways that really um, uh, are important to them. The, the next sort of chapter is topic of, of safety. And, and first, um, there's the issue of like getting to parts of the world that don't have engineering at all. And this is a building in northern China, um, unreinforced bricks and mud mortar, untied roofs, um, just really dangerous and devastating. But then we also have. Um, uh, if we can click to the video, um, this is a test from Taiwan. These are this is a non-ductile um, concrete frame, and here you, you're going to see what happens to non-ductile concrete columns uh, during an earthquake. Okay, next image. And the next is just a, a close-up of the same, uh, same column. And you can see what happens with limited displacement.
Okay, next image. This is a video from Mexico City, I believe. This is a non-ductal uh, concrete frame. No, no mames la gente, pásense, sí, por no, favor. Sí, no, ya sé, ya sé. Güey, nos salimos del, del conde. Ah, exacto, güey. Sí. No puedo. No está ni siquiera. So there's a compelling need to um, repair, uh, retrofit these buildings all over the world. Um, and, and I think um, as we're talking about resilience, we, we have to sort of balance the issue of, of all the work needed to uh, get to these old buildings and, and, and make them safe. But then when we talk about new buildings and this chapter on expected performance, um, it, it's important to, to kind of see kind of how we um, make choices between strength and displacement. I use this um, uh, capacity spectra graphic as a way of, of illustrating or thinking about how you have the choice of being stronger or having higher displacement capacity. In the United States, our codes tend to um, emphasize uh, high ductility designs, and these can be problematic. But you can see that there are many ways to survive an earthquake in terms of, of, of this combination of strength and ductility. So when we think about ductile designs, you know, in, in this diagram, an eccentric brace frame, you can see you've got the special yielding zones that dissipate energy. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a great cost-effective strategy for safety, and I think our codes have done a really good job at uh, designing for safety. But I think we can also move beyond safety and offer clients more. This graphic is a, the concrete wall version of it, and I show it also where clients can see that there's something happening to the structure, you know, plastic hinge and all, all of that stuff, and that's all important to structural engineers. But there's also something happening to the skin uh, and the people inside of it. And all of this uh, brings up to the point is that ductility is damage. And so the perspective of a high ductility design that's inexpensive um, because it's weak, is, it can be really problematic from the perspective of stakeholders. And, and my concern, and I think it should be the concern of all structural engineers, is our clients don't know what they're getting. Um, I, our codes are based on technology that, that, that's, that's older and getting safety, the safety problem solved was the best we could do uh, many, many years ago. But I think we can do much, much better with, with new technologies. And we have a communication issue about teaching stakeholders and clients uh, what their choices are in terms of different design strategies. So now I'm going to switch and talk about patterns and clues. And these are retrofits where um, I, I, I would learn something in terms of um, how design, how, how buildings really can perform. The first pattern and clue um, was the discovery for me of, of mode shaping spines. An example of this is the Shimbashira, the central pole in a Japanese pagoda. And it, what I think is really elegant here is that the, the temple builders from a thousand years ago somehow figured out without nonlinear response history analysis that a simple pole in a stone well could give you really great performance of a stacked um, building that would other otherwise form story mechanisms. And there are studies that have shown that you can get really good performance out of a system like this. But we've taken this sort of ancient idea and you can apply it and we've applied it to moment frame buildings. So in this case, we have buildings that would otherwise form a, a, um, a plastic hinge at the ground floor that tends to be weak um, and, and soft by introducing a spine on the right. And what the spine does, it's sort of like um, after the fact changes the strong column weak gir girder dynamic that you have built in the code. So an example is a retrofit of a building. This is a a building in downtown San Francisco, and it has a steel moment frame. It's a, it's a tough, bolted frame, um, reasonably ductile, but it has a tall first story, and it tends to have a weak first story. And the retrofit was the addition of a central spine, a reinforced concrete spine, 
put on a um, pin support, which is a base isolator. And here you see the two different modes. Um, there's something goofy on the graphic on the right, but ignore that for a second. But on the left, what you see is before retrofit, um, all the, the concentrated damage at the, at the lower stories. And then on the, on the left, you see the spine where the spine straightens the building out and it, it like the Shimbashira, has the lower part of the building talk to the upper part of the building, activating all the potential of the existing frame that would otherwise be isolated uh, in the lower part of the building. These are the drift plots. Uh, green is before retrofit, blue is after retrofit. And what you see is the belly uh, on the drift plot on the very far left is where um, you had ex extensive deformations at the lower floors. And then the blue straightens it out um, once you add the spine. You also see in the pushovers um, going from a system that is brittle to a system that can that can sustain large displacements, again, just by, by activating the spine. Uh, technically, we've added no strength to this building. Just a couple shots of how it was constructed. Far left is the connection of the spine to the floor system. This, this was done with um, uh, BRB links because there's some uh, complex, fussy um, displacement compatibility issues going on here. Uh, upper right is the uh, project engineer giving a sense of scale at the base of the spine. And lower right is the pin connection uh, where, where the spine will be um, supported on its weight. Now the next element is the, my discovery of, of rocking. Um, and I guess rocking has been around since buildings have been around. Um, but for me, it was a discovery in a retrofit building in, in Berkeley, California. And this building is unusual, and there are two reinforced concrete cores. And at the top of the cores are these mega frames that support all the steel um, floors. And so there are no columns in this building. And as a result, the cores themselves have a lot of gravity load on them. So when the original engineer designed the MoMA capacity of the core, because there's so much gravity on it, they needed very little um, reinforcement. And so it's a very unusual configuration. But the building in the 60s also had vulnerabilities in terms of brittleness. It had uh, foundations that needed to be strengthened by adding new piers, so we fixed that. And the black area of the base is where we added carbon fiber to remove the shear modes. Uh, we also had issues of confine problems with confinement and lap splices. Uh, these we fixed by adding uh, the, if you look at the image on the right, orange pens that fixed the um, lap splices, but they also added um, confinement. So they're like adding uh, clamping ties after the fact. And then here you see the carbon fiber. This uh, concept was tested before the design. So upper right is the test setup. It was at McGill University. Lower right, if you look at the two historic lo loops, the red is the original condition. You see it's weaker um, and it can't displace very far and the black is in the strengthened condition. The image on the left is the uh, retrofitted wall with the carbon fiber and the strengthened pins. So once we fixed the ductility issues or the, all the brittle modes, we can look at how the building displaces um, in terms of the, the, the pushover strengths. And what we noticed was in the direction that's being loaded, we got a hysteretic loop that was extremely pinched. We got no energy dissipation. And at the same time, we're reading Nigel Priestley's paper on myths and fallacies of earthquake engineering. And there was the um, myth and fallacy about how important energy dissipation was. And here we're seeing this example where in our pushover, uh, we got no energy dissipation, super tight, loops, again, because of all the axial load and the very little re uh, reinforcement, we get inelastic, um, uh, sorry, elastic nonlinear rocking, no energy absorption. Then we push the building, um, but what we found is the building recentered. The building performed really well. Displacements were nicely in control, um, great performance. 
Then we pushed it in the other direction where we have coupling beams and found out where we had energy absorption, the building didn't perform as well. The coupling beams yielded dissipated energy, but the building got stuck and we had um, uh, residual drifts. And so here we we're getting this real life example telling us, sort of proving the, the one of the central tenets of Nigel Priestley's paper. Now, going into real buildings or, or new buildings um, uh, where we could do resilient design, we have um, the San Francisco Public Utilities building. And this is a new building which is the direct descendant of the previous retrofit. It's a reinforced concrete core, but instead of having gravity loads from the truss, we added vertical post tensioning. If you look closely um, in, the, in, the, um, in the cables, you'll see that um, where the vertical post tensioning is. And these are unbonded tendons. They loop through the foundation and they anchor at the roof. So it's a way of adding a clamping force, like emulating the gravity load that we had from the previous design. The simple diagram shows how the clamping force is applied at the roof. We get the rocking through the anchorage. The mild steel it does energy dissipation and we get the simple hysteretic loop, which is pinched. And if you look at, you, at the shape of the loop, it tends to recenter because of that, the pinch condition. We also studied the coupling beams. In a traditional coupling beam, it's deep and it, and it attracts lots of load. Um, it's you know, very ductile. We put the, the diagonal cross in there, um, but, it's, but it's expensive. But it, and it also makes the building tend to get stuck. And so we took a lesson from the retrofit and said, let's make our coupling beams uh, thinner and go from a shear mechanism to a flexural mechanism. So we took the, the coupling beams and we kept making them thinner and thinner and thinner until we switched modes. And then in the final design, you can see uh, the coupling beam. We've got this steel armor, which became um, a, me a means to avoid damage to the reinforced concrete, take shear loads, but allow flexure. And we also had post tensioning in the slab that added um, the recentering. So we took something that was a liability and made it um, um, an element that contributed to the recentering of the, of the building. Now, this next example is a case where we did the exact same kind of rocking recentering idea, but in steel buildings. Um, let's see, little little problem with the image, but we'll, we'll get through that. What we have is a steel frame. We've got vertical post tensioning through this U-shaped loop anchored at the top. Some special detailing. This is the base where we have um, angles that are fuses that can um, be replaced after an earthquake and some special detailing at the at the collector. So this um, video, if you go ahead and play that, um, just shows how the, the frame rocks back and forth. See, it's loading up. Up, oh, wrong video, we could move on. See if we can get to the next one. If we can't get to the next one, we can just we can just kind of move on with the presentation. Okay, here it comes. Okay, so it looks like we're that that video was 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 giving us fits, but we'll move on. Um, but if we can look at the hysteretic loop, what you see is you can develop the 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 uh, hysteretic loop by just superimposing the um, Nonlinear elastic rock, elastic rocking component, which is PT, which is PT times the the base of the building, um, add to it a yielding component, which was that angle with the replaceable fuse, and you get the flag loop. And then here, this is the theoretical um, residual drift, which is which is quite small. In real life, when you shake the building, um, the, these the, um, they tended to recenter quite well, even. Uh, without this, uh, even with this theoretical um, residual drift. 
this concept was tested at um, Mickey City, the e-defense table in Japan. This was work done by uh, Professor Greg Deerline at Stanford and Professor Jerry Hajar. Uh, he's now at, at Northeastern. Um, let's go to the next video. Okay, here we go. Um, what we have is cameras at the base of the building. The upper is the upper. Uh, the upper cameras are at the feet of the building, of, of the frame. Lower left is the uh, is the energy dissipation device, and lower right is the overall test mechanism. And if you look in, you'll see the yellow frame inside there. The upper elements, you can see these are the feet lifting during rocking and recentering. So this this frame went through uh, many many um, extremely large earthquakes with no damage to the structure no damage to the post-tension cable. Um, there were two sets of dampers used, um, but um, they were just swapped out for experimental reasons, so there's no damage whatsoever. So ex exceptional performance. Uh, next image. So we've, at, you know, at this point, sort of in this, this journey, we're figuring out how resilience is working. Um, and some of the kind of, um, issues about typology and the, the impact of walls and the importance of, of stiffness, at least initial stiffness, um, and the, the benefit of rocking. And now what we're trying to do is figure out how to get low cost resilience. And this is where we come to Casa Adelante. This is a, an affordable housing project in uh, uh, the Mission District in San Francisco. It's 100% affordable. Um, and all the uh, occupants are seniors. 25% of the units are set aside for seniors who were formerly homeless. Um, so I took this as a, a really great opportunity to think about the context where re resilience really matters. Uh, these are folks that don't have lots of extra resources. Uh, they, they can't go stay at a hotel after an earthquake or go stay with relatives especially the folks that were that were formerly homeless. So here's a case where um, if we could really do resilience, it would, it, would, it, would, it would greatly help folks who just need to stay in their homes after a major earthquake. Uh, but the elephant in the room here, let's see if we can get that, get out of here. I'm getting back, there we go, uh, is that there's no money for improved resilience. Um, if there was any extra money, the developers would would spend the money to make more housing, and this is a case where where the acute needs that we have, especially in California, for housing, um, greatly overwhelm the need for future earthquake resilience. And but we took this as a constraint and said, okay, what we need to do, or what we're going to do, is have a zero premium, zero cost for resilience. And we're going to design the most resilience we can in this building, working with the zero cost constraint um, and, and see if we can, we, we can pull this off. This is the basic um, early engineering model uh, where we have nine story building, uh, reinforced concrete flat plates. Uh, but we knew some, some, some basic typology information. This is from a FEMA P58 study on typologies. And in these, the study, what, 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 the, um, what our group found was that reinforced concrete shear walls tend to be stiffer than all, all the other um, prevalent typologies, especially compared to steel um, um, moment frames or buckling restrained brace frames. And we know from uh, studies that initial stiffness is a, a, a great contributor to low damage. So starting with the wall building gives us a, a leg up. So the first step is figure out how we can get a wall building in, in, uh, in our design. Uh, the next sort of insight from this typology study uh, is also looking at repair times. And what we have are four different um, design conditions. We have an office building and a hospital, and they're different because they have different context or contents. 
um, and we have um, one designed for a low risk category and the other one designed for high risk category. But in every condition, the, the circled area is the, dam is the repair time for the wall building. And you compare it to the repair times for all the other typologies. And in every case, the wall building um, performs better than the moment frame buildings and the steel brace frame buildings. Um, it's, it's the best performing building straight out of the gate. I'm only showing you repair times, but if you look at repair cost, you find a similar trend. And um, uh, displacement times, um, you find the same trend. So we took the insights from, from a wall building and said, OK, this, will, this gets us part of the way there. Um, and so we took our building and he said, what do we have in this building that we're going to buy anyway? We're going to buy the gravity slabs, and we're going to buy the mat slab here. And the thinking where we could combine the ideas of rocking is, could we tune the building and design the slabs in such a way that they tended to promote rocking and not get stuck um, at the after, um, uh, during the earthquake response. And effectively, what we're kind of saying is, is we want stronger um, um, uh, bottom steel in the mat, and we want weaker top steel in the mat. Uh, because when the wall flexes and, and rocks, the, um, if it's too strong in the negative bending areas, it'll, it'll tend to get stuck. And so we think we, we thought we could figure out how to tune this and take advantage of, of all these characteristics intrinsic in the building. But I'm going to go back one second. Three of these five walls are nicely located. And in this case, like you can see, um, we, we've got um, a wall with slab all around it. And these three do really well because there's plenty of slab. But these guys are near the edge of the building, and there's nothing we can do about it because of the, the plan configuration. And they don't do really well in terms of energy absorption. And so we needed a little help in terms of, of um, the design of the damper, or, or the design of the foundation. And we started um, experimenting with adding damping into the foundation. And this is a case where the, uh, the mat would rock and activate, during rocking, activate a damper um, uh, for these two walls that, that are otherwise misbehaving. And at this point in the process, we're designing two parallel um, buildings, one that is high performance and the other that's conventional. And we're doing this because we have to still hit the target of zero cost increase. And when we got pretty far down the line, we had the buildings, the two designs priced and found that we were close to cost neutral, even including um, an allowance to design the damper. So once we were we had the hope of being cost neutral, we were given the green light to design the performance-based design. This is our, our um, mat foundation. And what we did is we turned it into a, a, a net of, um, of nonlinear elements that would be able to rock and yield um, and give us our response. And these are the two areas where we had the tricky um, parts of the mat where there wasn't enough um, mat to do adequate energy absorption, where we needed some sort of foundation damping. This is a the model of the upper part of the slab, a, a similar kind of net or network of, of elements. And you focus in, and you can look at some of the, the key modeling elements. One of the things to take away is, is that we have a wall, and we have post-tensioning, and we have top steel, and we have bottom steel, and we can take strips and, and, um, and discretize the, the slab into beam, nonlinear beam type elements and figure out how to model and capture them. And thus, we can tune them. If we can model them, we can tune them. And in and, and doing so, we can uh, promote rocking um, and curtail the, the propensity of the building 
to uh, get have uh, residual drips. At this point in the process, we theoretically had a good design. Um, uh, the models are working. The problem is we don't have a building. Um, the buildings, you know, you know, we're we're literally in the in the, the sketch stage. Uh, we know we need a damper. Um, at this point, um, I'm attending the U.S. Uh, New Zealand Japan workshop at NARA Japan, and I run across uh, Ken Elwood and Jeff Rogers, you know, and we're just talking in the hotel lobby and, um, you know, exchanging pleasantries and, and asking, like, what are you working on? And at the, and I'm stuck. I don't have a design. I've tried um, BRBs. I've tried uh, other kinds of dampers. I've tried yielding metal things. Nothing nothing works. And Jeff opens up his um, PowerPoint and, and starts showing me um, all this work he's been doing on lead extrusion dampers. And um, you know the, the the basic concept is simple, and and and, and, and I understand it. it's been done years before. Um, but we started talking and sharing, and Ken Ken was there, and it, it was this opportunity to like, you know, let's collaborate, let's do this thing on a real project, go from um, theoretical research to uh, um, doing some real good on a real project at at um, at a great scale um, for folks who really need it. So Ken, uh, sorry, so Jeff joined the team um, uh, and uh, designed the damper. Uh, these are all the components of, of the damper. It's, it's a really simple one, um, mechanism. You know, you've got a steel shaft, you've got a bulge. It's embedded in, um, in solid lead. During an earthquake, the bulge is run through the lead, and um, it, it melts it and reforms and dissipates energy in that. Um, in that that simple mecha mechanism. Uh, now that we've got a real damper, we're running our models. We're getting good performance. Um, uh, the, our drift plots are looking good. Um, these straight lines indicate that we're getting um, like pure rocking in the, in the behavior. Nice tilting. Uh, we we've got good um, uh, residual drift, so we're getting um, low residual drift, so we're getting recentering of the building. Um, and, and it's all working well. I also want to put a, a great um, expression of gratitude out to Professor Greg Deerline. Uh, Greg's a, he, at Stanford University. Uh, he's a, a dear friend as well as a colleague, um, but kind of like uh, with the, the issue with, with, with Jeff, I said, Greg, I'm working on this great project. Um, it's for formerly homeless seniors. Uh, can we you know, if we can do this zero-cost, resilient design, um, you know, we we can really do something. Uh, problem is, we don't have, we, you know, we don't have any extra money. Uh, would you do the peer review for us? Um, but we can't pay you. And uh, Greg joined on um, and and um, donated all his time pro bono. So really appreciate that. Um, it, and so at this point, we've got a team, uh, Jeff designing the damper, uh, Greg doing the peer review, our team doing the design. Um, we, uh, Jeff was great, came out to San Francisco, uh, did design charrettes, worked this thing out, uh, fabricated and tested. Here you see the results, really great results, um, nice and stable, uh, strong. Um, here are the dampers when they, they arrived in San Francisco. The team was, uh, construction team was super happy when these guys showed up. And then a couple of construction site, site um, photos. On the left, the, the, the gentlemen are installing the damper. It's connected to, um, to the pier in the foundation. And um, they're, they're literally standing in the mat slab right now. And they're putting on a steel shroud that protects the damper so it doesn't get um, full of concrete. On the right is right before the, the mat gets installed. Here's the, the mat slab. Here's a photo of one of the upper slabs. Uh, we also did ductile detailing of the walls. One of our biggest concerns was that the walls would be, too, uh, the mat could be too strong or the slabs could be too strong. And if if that were the case, what would happen is the wall, the building would, would revert to a conventional building. So we have all the, the conventional ductile de detailing at the plastic hinge. Uh, 
a couple construction sh photos. Uh, typically, when we talk to owners, there's this question of investing in seismic resilience. And in this case, if we, you look at a conventional building, you have construction cost in green and future losses in terms of loss of use uh, and damage. And then we need to make the argument that you invest in a premium and recoup future savings. Uh, in the case of Casa Adelante, we did uh, loss modeling of our building. The, gra the, the, the bars on the right are the conventional design, and on the left are the, the, the resilient design. And we looked at small earthquakes all the way up to large earthquakes, and you see where the losses occur. Uh, the orange is lost to the structure, blue is lost to the stucco skin, um, uh, pink is to the partitions. And the big difference is the, the decrease in loss to the structure with the resilient design. We did a you know, present value analysis of this, and what you find is that the resilient building is worth more than the conventional building when you account for uh, future losses and integrate all the probabilistic loss potential into present value. The resilient building is worth more than a half million dollars more than the conventional building in its, um, uh, in its current state. Other metrics of performance um, are the cost. This was the big driver again. Our target was zero extra. Uh, we, we barely missed. Uh, we were about $100,000 um, over in US dollars. Considering the project cost, that's 0.24%. So we're, the team is quite pleased with how close we came. Um, and it's a, a, a good example of trying to hit a target um, and, and working to, to uh, doing everything you can to get there. Um, the San Francisco Office of Resilience targets for good buildings uh, four weeks of displacement of, for the occupants. Um, for our building, after the same earthquake, we would have zero days of loss of, loss of use. Uh, we would have functional recovery in one day and full recovery in four, four weeks. So we, get, we did really well in terms of the loss metrics. Um, finally, we got the gold rating from the US Resilience Council. It's the first building, uh, multi-unit housing building to receive, um, to be rated. Um, uh, we also think it's the first, one of the first buildings in the U.S. for, for um, people of limited means um, to be a resilient building. So we're super excited uh, about that groundbreaking news. Now I'm going to go to the last uh, mini topic, which is creating affordable resilience. And really quickly, um, we're doing some work along with many others uh, for the World Bank, and this is retrofit work in uh, Kyrgyzstan. The project's called ERIC. And for this, we're looking at retrofitting all the schools in the country. And as a part of that, a bunch of the schools are, are just too poor and they're going to need to get replaced. And we want to make, um, we want to consider how we could make resilient schools, but make them less expensive than current designs. So this is a Kyrgyz classroom. Uh, uh, these are the kids in one of the classrooms. And this is the typical typology. Uh, the, it's uh, unreinforced masonry, uh, that's, that's the, the construction. And in our study, we've been looking at how masonry walls fail, that you can slide, you can have shear, you can have crushing, and you can have rocking. Now, most of these modes are really poor, but the rocking modes offer great potential to get good, good performance, even though it's made out of unreinforced masonry. So we took the conventional type school and we, we modeled it first, did all the nonlinear stuff, did the pushover, and found um, that the building was reasonably strong but quite brittle if you look at the pushover on the right. Then when you, um, then for the experiment, we said let's take the wall above and remove the head and the sills, get rid of those, and take the piers and concentrate it into two bookends or, or rocking blocks, and then and then see how the building performs. 
what we've done is we've reduced the net masonry wall area by 47%. So we have half the area um, of, of the two, uh, between the two before and after. We're going to take that money and see if we can put it into supporting the structure in the middle of the, of the building and improve the architectural facade in terms of the quality of the windows and um, uh, the light per performance and, and the energy uh, performance. And when you took a look at the before and after, what you see just by changing configuration is before we get brittle behavior and in blue we get a stronger building but we get a um, much greater displacement ability, uh, displacement ability due, due to the rocking. And, and again, this is with only about half of the masonry area. So we've actually saved money, better performance. This is my last slide. Um, let's see, this GIF, hopefully it starts moving. But what, we, what I've done is I've, um, if you, let's see, this is actually a video. If you could uh, um, uh, click on it and see if it will move. Nope, didn't, it's not moving. So maybe it won't move. Okay, but what happens, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wing it here. I took the Ismith earthquake and ran it through this nonlinear model. And this model just rocked back and forth, back and forth, and at the end of this earthquake, recentered. Then I took the thing and I put in, um, I doubled the earthquake and I got it to recenter. And then I, and then I just scaled the earthquake by three times and got it to recenter. So what this is showing is that we can actually make walls with, with um, less masonry or less money by tuning the configuration, by just changing the shape, recognizing what the nonlinear performance uh, could be through uh, basic mechanisms like rocking and get resilient structures for no extra cost. So that's the, that's the promise um, of what we're doing. Uh, with that, I'm going to close my, my talk, uh, turn it over to the, the next group, um, but really excited as a fellow traveler um, in terms of the, this resilient journey that we're all on, and, and, and I mean it this as a part of a global community of earthquake engineers. Um, I, I, I think we're, we're on the verge of doing some really great things. So thank you very much. David, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. Um, we're going to hold questions right now and have them at the end. So I'd like to ask um, Alistair and Rowan to now present. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Waiting for the presentation to come up, but um, so our presentations on uh, not so much the uh, zero additional cost side of things. We're talking about three base isolated buildings. I'd love to think about some time in the future where we could do base isolated buildings for no um, additional cost, but I don't think that's happening in the short term. Um, so these are all value propositions, and we'll take you through some of those client decisions that the client believe they were better value for them for their returns in, in different ways. So. Um, Wearing two hats, I'm also on the committee that helped uh, draft the guidelines that are out uh, at the moment and, and our thought about doing this paper was um, just to sort of capture um, some of the test driving of the, uh, of the draft guidelines and maybe uh, put a few things out there that people can reflect on when they're using the draft guidelines um, so that when we eventually get some funding to finalise them, um, there's some good material there, um, starting from ours, and it'd be great for other people to accumulate this too, and we can get a bit of a repository of, of it all. So, um, without ado, um, I won't read all that out, but because um, Helen introduced us at the beginning, so we'll just take you through the three buildings first, and then talk about some of the how they ran through the guidelines, and then some conclusions at the end. So the first is the new um, conference centre here in Wellington. Um, it's called Wakek. That's the architectural dream. Um, it's a very large floor plate, big building grid, um, lots of open spaces on the inside. Um, there's a cross section through the building. Um, we've got some driven piles um, through some quite mixed soils that also liquefy. There are actually piles under here, but 
Um, what we've been um, elected to do is a, um, is a CBF frame. It's actually a die grid because the, the gravity loads are carried by the frame too, but it's inside the building. And the thought with that is to allow great flexibility of the access through the bracing of the building. So the lower floors are gallery exhibition floors and the upper floors are the conference floors. Why did we base isolate uh, this building? Um, Wellington City Council is very aware of our vulnerability here in Wellington. Um, they didn't want to spend the money trying to create an additional emergency centre. There's a lot of um, infrastructure requirements for that if it's really going to work like that. But they wanted more and more options and facilities that would, would get um, affected in different ways. So, so they wanted um, this really large asset to, to have its own uh, um, natural resilience in terms of being able to be reused if there was a disaster. And there's also obviously um, the smaller, more regular earthquakes and they want to get a continuity of use so that um, COVID aside that when we have these um, uh, um, events that, that um, we don't have to be cancelling conferences and all that sort of thing and they can carry on using this um, important public facility. Um, City Council's also had a bit of a mixed run with all their assets and through the uh, Sedan and Kaikoura earthquakes and so that was very mindful for them for the, the long term cost benefits. We, um, we didn't do some very detailed studies on this but um, they kind of uh, took um, uh, the idea of base isolating it as, a, as that it would have um, when you consider a um, an asset for someone who's going to own it for 50 years that would naturally, um, as David said, have a greater value in the long term if you're not just considering a sort of 10 year developer type life. Um, and from our selfish point of view, structurally, um, it's quite difficult to provide big open buildings with holes in them, um, lots of staircases and escalators and stuff, um, and have a nice regular structure. So we've got to see, we can have a CBF structure and base isolate it and do all our uh, energy absorption at the isolation plant. Cool, so thank you Alistair. So this is site 9, um, so I was pretty heavily involved in the design of this one. As you can see from the, the title of the slide and the water in the foreground, it's on the Wellington waterfront. So that's quite a, quite a tricky site commercially for a number of reasons. Being on the waterfront, so re resource consent for buildings on the waterfront is always a bit tricky. So it really um, drives you to have to have quite expensive architectural finishes. Um, amongst other things. It's also quite a small floor plate, so you've got a, and then quite a bad aspect ratio, so you've got a lot of facade in relation to the amount of livable floor area you have. So there's quite a lot of financial pressure on this one, especially for A-grade office space. So this is the plan on the isolation level. So basically we've got a lot of flat surface sliders in the middle, which allow you to have a smaller column beneath, and then a lot of lever, rubber bearings around the edges to provide you with restoring force and um, a bit of torsional stiffness. Um, so as you can sort of see if you squint at this drawing, so the column, so the base isolation system is at the top of the ground floor column. This was part, well largely driven by the financial constraints, so there's quite a lot of contaminated ground beneath the building and the contractor really wanted to avoid trying to excrete too much of that and there wasn't there was really a good business case of building a basement, so we had to put um, the isolators at the top of the column. Pretty tricky structurally, you certainly have to be very careful about the, um, the stiffness of your ground floor columns, but possibly even more tricky architecturally because you, you have to accommodate a very big movement in a joint that's also expected to be watertight. Um, just fun slide, so as I said, it's right, right next to the water, and the um, so the uh, my point is not working. But um, so the 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 water line's about here, so you get quite a quite a large lateral spread out towards the harbour, and then the, the seawall helps restrain this a little bit. But there's there's a break in the seawall about where I've left that cursor, so quite a lot of the ground wants to really squirt out towards that edge. This is a, just another um, tricky constraint on the building. It really drives the need for quite large piles. So the, the reasons for base isolation for this one. So it's almost really a given for some of these A-grade office spaces, as is in Wellington. So 
as I says, sort of the new normal. So this is driven both by, from a client perspective and from a tenant perspective. Quite a lot of tenants expect, um, experienced quite a disruption uh, following some of the recent earthquakes, particularly the Kaipura earthquake, and they're now willing to pay quite a premium for being able to get back into their buildings quickly. And I said uh, the high level of, uh, the high level isolation is driven by the desire to limit excavation. So the third one, something a bit uh, a bit funkier. Um, we've done a, a couple of tall uh, base isolated buildings, doing them very stiffly. Um, there was this was an apartment building, and there was a perception that um, next to a base isolated apartment building, the bottom floors here are uh, planned to be offices, but it's apartments from here on upwards. Um, the cantilever, oh, sorry, the cantilever at this end um, is really that the client owns the site here and isn't developing it quite yet and they wanted to get as much glory as they can so this is a sort of cheeky developer solution to make our life a lot harder um, and but because we've got a quite a um, rigid superstructure we've got the advantage to do some little mild um, things we wouldn't normally do with um, conventional buildings so the isolation plane for this building is is down here so I'll just go to a plan so this is this is the footprint of the tower with the, di with the CBF diagrid kind of hybrid around the outside, and then that drives down through the office building, so you walk through it for the, for the larger podium levels. Um, this building's on lead rubber bearings or under the tower, and some slider bearings under the podium at the front, um, which is similar to the conference centre, which I forgot to touch on before, which has lead rubber bearings predominantly under the, under the CBF bracing, and some slider bearings under the more lightly loaded columns. So here's our cross sections. We've got a combination of diagonal CBF braces um, in the apartments that would seem to be a lot um, easier architecturally to work through in terms of getting balconies and windows in. Um, using the, the diagrid form, which we've done before, is a lot better for walking through it, but um, the steeper braces are a lot harder to integrate into apartment type architecture um, for the primary views out the front and the back. On the side walls, we used the slightly more efficient diagrid to brace it um, in the transverse direction. So drives for base isolation. This is um, this isn't on the waterfront. This is an A to A plus grade um, apartments. So, um, but some of the apartments that were in the higher end were disrupted because of the higher shaking around Wellington waterfront in Kaikoura. So there was a there was a concern that um, it, you know well pitched. Higher end apartments wouldn't wouldn't sell so well because of some of that that um, concern. So there was the idea that you could base isolate and then sell for a premium over the top of other buildings around there, even though you weren't in a in a waterfront um, situation. And as it happened, they sold like hotcakes, which was great for our developer and um, keeping the project going. Um, so the beauty for us was that we were able to detail the building a lot more simply because we weren't allowing for for high drifts within the building and that affected building costs, kept the building costs down. Um, so the apartment detailing which has lots and lots of plasterboard and fire ceilings and acoustic ceilings and that sort of thing, they could be done far more conventionally rather than allowing for the large movements that, that are needed in Wellington when you design, um, design conventional structures. Um, and then we've got our, um, our lovely little cantilever, uh, cheeky cantilever at the end. So I don't think we would have uh, let the client do that if we hadn't been base isolating. Oh, so this slide um, seems to have got completely bastardised uh, in the um, so <laughs> your side, in, in the way the PowerPoint's showing. Yes, yeah, so it's not quite working as we uh, <laughs> we had hoped. But um, so this is the first of a couple of learnings that we've got from doing these um, doing some of these buildings and, and doing them in relation to the new guidelines. So that. This is so ground motion directionality. This is really about how what the seismologists give us and how it relates to performance of a traditional building versus an isolated building. So generally, the if you'll allow me to phrase, the angle of attack of the earthquake will be um, at an angle to the orientated axes of a building. Not so much of a problem for traditional buildings because um, you have two orthogonal directions yeah, in them. And the, so you've got your two orthogonal directions and the likelihood of your maximum angle of attack coinciding with 
either of the two directions your frame is pretty unlikely. Um, for, for an isolated building, um, oh, there we go. I hope that's working for everyone now. So, um, for an isolated building, you'll experience all possible movements, the maximum of which is probably at an angle to the um, as recorded directions. Um, we, we've lost our ability to advance. Oh, thank you. So, So, when you subject a single degree of freedom oscillator to an earthquake-induced ground motion, you get a you get a displacement trace something like that little graph that I've shown there. So in New Zealand, we define our spectra in terms of what's called SA larger. So it's larger of at two as recorded directions of the earthquake. It's a pretty good uh, parameter for designing a frame building. Chances are the frame won't experience, or both the frames won't experience quite that force. As mentioned, for, a, um, for an isolated building, you'll experience all possible movements, the, the maximum of which can be quite considerably more than either of your two perpendicular frames. And this parameter is called SA Watt D100, um, which, is a, which is a, can be quite a useful technical term for describing it. Um, so what this means in terms of design, so it means that your ADRS, your hand calc analysis using 11 to 70 spectra is typically a bit non-conservative. Typically you'll underestimate your displacements by something in the region of about 15%. You overcome this when you do time history analysis because you, you can output the two perpendicular directions and take square root of some of the squares of the two. That will give you your lot 100 parameter. Um, the problem is that you're you're scaling SA larger to SA larger, and the ratio of your Watt 100 to your SA larger for your earthquakes within your suite is not always the same as average, so you can be randomly either quite conservative or quite non conservative. And in this in this chart here, so this is a this is an earthquake suite that we got from another consultant. So as you can see, because they've used the 1170 scaling. The, the displacement that you'll get from, um, from this graph is quite considerably more than what you get just using the design spectra, and that's because of this, this sort of randomness of directionality of the earthquakes. So this is pretty easily overcome by simply using the ASC 7 Chapter 16 approach. So they've recently moved to using Rot 100 as their design parameter of choice. And then they developed Rot 100 spectra for each of their earthquakes in this week, and they scale rot from Rot 100 to Rot 100. And that, this process is actually quite a bit easier than 1170 once you get used to it. And so we've ended up doing that for these build, these three buildings um, uh, in, our, in a design process in, consult, in consultation with the uh, seism seismologist who gave us the records and the peer review of, those, of that seismology. And it, it gives you quite a big design advantage, really, because you're able to use more of your displacement, so you don't have to stiffen your building considerably and worsen your performance in small earthquakes. Um, so next we have ADRS analysis, so acceleration displacement response spectrum analysis. So a simple hand calculation method for determining the displacements of your building. Um, so we at Daily Prof are quite big fans of hand calculations. For one, they, they can prevent you from making embarrassing mistakes, which is dear to the heart, I'm sure, of all designers. Um, they also allow you to analyze lots of systems very quickly, and which can really um, can develop you an instinct for, for design and um, help you really balance all the different design parameters that you're juggling. Um, so the, there's several different formulas for judging the effects of damping. Um, the New Zealand guidelines use the the least conservative of uh, three common formulas. So that's the green line in this little chart here. The red is the Eurocode 8 formula, and the, um, the blue is the ASCE Ashto formula. So I've, I've found that this, the New Zealand formula is accurate for far field hazards, like for, for subduction earthquakes, for example, but non conservative for shallow crustal earthquakes. I've got, but I've got consistent good accuracy using the Eurocode 8 formula. For Wellington hazard. So as you can see from this two little graphs down here, so this is predicted displacement versus measured displacement from time history. The New Zealand formula consistently underpredicts 
displacements, whereas the Euro code 8 formula gives very consistent good accuracy. And this in the, the different colored dots are different building signs, so different record suites given to us from uh, different consultants, different limit states. So we're pretty confident of the accuracy of that. Um, lateral force distribution, so the, Terry Ryan out of the University of Nevada at Reno has done a lot of very good analysis on moment frame buildings, working with how much your, um, the shear and your superstructure has thrown up your building. So she's come up with a formula which is based on the effective damping of your system and uh, the flexibility of your, your superstructure. So the more damping you have, the more non-linearity you have, the more the flexible your superstructure, the more force you throw up your building. Um, and as you can see from the, the top graph, so this is the analysis that I did on the Site 9 building, which has a moment frame. Um, so the green is what is predicted from Kerry Ryan's analysis, the orange is what I get from time history. As you can see, the green gently, overlap, uh, sorry, gently envelopes the nonlinear time history analysis at all floors of the building. Is exactly what you want. Um, unfortunately, there's no equivalent method for concentrically braced frame structures due to their um, quite different dynamic properties, um, especially once you base isolate them, the mode of participation factors are quite different. Um, and it, as you can see from the chart, so the, the Ryan analysis in the green consistently uh, dramatically over predicts what you get from the time history in the orange. This um, leaves it desirable to the unenviable choice of either using a very conservative method or relying on heavily on their time history, which can, can really tie your head in knots and be quite hard to, quite a process to justify. Um, so part spectra, so this is, let's say, almost a, the extra for experts when it comes to low damage design. So um, when you base isolate a building, in general you, you get much better performance um, in terms of low damage than you do for an um, equivalent non-base isolated building. Um, but when you when you don't well isolate your building, you you don't necessarily get this good performance. So if you're if you're building if your your superstructure period isn't well separated from your isolator period, or if you have too strong a building. Um, you can really significantly amplify the response of um, various parts within your building. So as can be seen in the, the orange line in this graph, so while the, the first mode of response of the, of the building is quite low down here, you've actually very, really significantly amplified the response up your building. And this is from having a too strong of a structure. And it's sort of, you've actually amplified it more than the 1170 part spectra equivalent from a conventional building. And as you can also see from the graph, uh, simple design decisions um, can really help to um, considerably reduce these amplifications. And in the blue, simply by taking out some of the lead from your lead rubber bearing, replacing it with a post yield, uh, a bit more post yield stiffness, you've softened that peak. And then in the yellow, if you then considerably reduce your damping, let the displacement increase a little bit, or quite a lot, you've almost halved your spectral accelerations, which can have a massive beneficial effect on mechanical plant, partitions, all that sort of thing in your building. So being in Wellington, uh, having gone through Kaikoura, um, Basin Edge Effects came up in all three designs. Um, it's still an open question. None of our um, seismologists have yet, uh, we're still trying to get our heads around this. Um, Brendan Co did a very good presentation uh, a couple of seminars ago in the series three of this uh, conference um, post presentation um, about the current thoughts around cities and some, re some really interesting stuff there about reflected waves and how they get trapped uh, under the crust um, and I think there's a lot, of, a lot more learnings to come out of that. Um, Rowan and I have done a bunch of um, analyses and looking into running the, um, these basic records that have some basin edge um, effects in them through isolated buildings. 
And what we typically found, um, there's a paper in the bulletin from last year, um, was that we were we were kind of, if, if you want to sort of simplify it, it's talking about the bump in the spectra for the basin edge. Um, the isolated buildings were kind of damping and travelling through the bump and out the other side. That's probably a gross oversimplification. Um, there's lots and lots of detail in the paper. So if you're really interested in, in this, look at the paper. But we feel that isolated buildings are still a good solution to provide additional robustness to basin edge effects, but there's still a heck of a lot of research to come on this topic. Um, so all three buildings, we had a site-specific seismic hazard analysis. Um, we generally considered, well, we told our clients that it was best practice to get that, um, especially with varying subsoils and, and subsoil um, substrata shapes in Wellington. Um, because uh, a lot of these are creating different spectra that are a different shape to the code, um, we've been getting these, well, the client's been getting these peer reviewed. Um, we found kind of a scatter in our take on them, you know, some of the stuff that Rowan did around well, how we should be scaling this with the ROT D100 um, effect. Um, we've kind of, we got all three buildings, um, the seismologists to agree and to agree with ourselves, um, but we found that process a little bit painful. Um, and I guess what we would be keen is like for to happen would be maybe the NZGS can maybe think about putting together a practice note about what um, now more and more firms are doing these site-specific hazard studies, what makes a good site-specific hazard studies and when you when you get peer reviews now that this is happening more and more often. And I guess we were questioning, um, you know, the client spent um, a lot of time and um, a lot of money on these site-specific studies, but they actually didn't change the buildings we designed. So we're doing more analysis, but are we actually creating better buildings from it? Yes, we need to know more and we need to not make mistakes, but I guess there's always a point where we might be doing too much analysis and not providing any better design. So um, I'm going to keep picking up on that theme on the next few slides. So modelling, um, we, uh, as Rowan said earlier, we're big fans of hand calcs in this firm. Um, you should be able to get, I would believe you should be able to get within 20% with a hand calc. Um, we did some, we created these kind of very unusual buildings and so they didn't fit into the normal um, simplified methods in the guidelines. So we've ended up um, verifying all these buildings through time history analysis, even though we've done approximate calculations to build up to that. Um, what came up during different peer reviews of the different buildings, um, what we didn't model, we made active decisions not to model because we didn't think we could do it accurately, um, vertical accelerations. So that's for two reasons. One is depending on how you set up your damping model um, in, your, in your analysis, say if you're using ETAB and you're using direct integration, using Rayleigh damping, um, you're almost not going to get any sensible results out of your vertical um, accelerations because the periods will be so high. So you'll be over damping these, these really short modes. So you're not actually going to get real results even though you'll be turning the vertical on, so to speak. So. Um, we also, uh, the scaling is very interesting for vertical records because it, the, how you want to scale what's critical vertical, vertically for what's critical horizontally really depends on your structure. You know, for our, these isolated buildings, it's what's happening at a large displacement and creating some vertical accelerations that's important and that's, there's no scaling procedures on how to work that out for different earthquakes. So, um, so what we did is we did some very more simplified, robust um, vertical acceleration checks for the buildings. What also came up was, should we be trying to model the buildings from way down at the unliquefied layers below these buildings and trying to model the soil column and foundations together, including the isolation plane and the whole structure all together? So that raises a whole lot of interesting questions of what loads do you feed in at the bottom? Um, because the loads for the right soil type are actually what happens at the surface. So what, what are you going to then turn down the scaling of, of, of those records to what actually would happen in the subgrade? And, and how accurately do we understand how to model these soil columns? A lot of it's done around research. Do you really want to hang a building design on this? So we said, no, let's use the spectra, uh, the surface driven, and create these good, robust um, substructures that can take um, some lateral movement and, uh, and continue to carry out vertical uh, analysis. Again, we didn't want to do too much, too much um, research while we're designing buildings. Um, being on the guidelines committee, I thought we'd made quite uh, simple um, procedures around doing all the low cases and what's collapse limit state, CALS and what's ULS, um, encouraging people to design for ULS for the whole structures and then checking the isolation plane and the structures that keep it stable at CALS. Um, 
what, we, what you find when you go through um, complex analysis is that it's, you get lots and lots of load cases because you've got bearings that have an upper bound and a lower bound of their outputs. Um, you've got lots of piles that have different stiffnesses that you want to vary, so you end up with um, literally dozens of load cases if you're not careful. Um, and what, um, for the structure, what, um, uh, what strength reduction factors do you want to put on your structure at each of those load cases because they have different risk factors associated with them. So um, maybe we need, in the guidelines, we need to kind of clear that up and maybe even strip it down to some just fewer cases that are, that are more likely to be the critical ones based on the experience of, of the people um, at the guidelines committee and, and others. Um, so it, we, we've been designing three plus another one, four base isolated buildings in this office since the guidelines came out mid last year. Um, we've also been involved in um, a couple of peer reviews of other people's work. So we've had some pretty robust internal and external conversations about so how, how the guidelines are how they're working. Um, so the, the guidelines have two factors, SP and alpha, for reducing demand for systems with less perceived risk. Um, this is possibly one too many factors. The combination of these two factors is quite a big reduction. And I guess also, so every consultant seems to understand the concept of SP a bit differently. Some, some people believe it shouldn't exist at all. I'm certainly not one of those, but um, it can mean that it's very tricky to get agreement with a peer review about when it when it should and shouldn't be used. So as as Al sort of alluded to, probably a, a bit of a more robust um, framework for when these reduction factors can and can't be used, but more similar to the material standards, would be quite a good idea. So in the buildings that we've shown, like for example, we haven't wanted to use reduction factors where, say on site nine where we're up on the top of the columns, or say for traditional flat sliders that are going parallel to lead rubber bearings because once they run out of travel um, you've gone too far. So you can design your main structure with some of these reduction factors but you want some additional resilience for those things that don't have that additional natural inherent robustness. So yeah, making some rules around that might be useful for others designing. So what other low damage features did we put in these buildings? Um, I alluded to before about the apartments were a lot easy, a lot easier to detail both in the facades and in the internals um, because of these nice stiff superstructures with the lower accelerations. Um, lots of different rattle space details we've come up with um, for the two um, buildings that have rattle spaces at ground level, um, trying to create cheap things that um, drain water and don't involve too many complicated details has been a challenge. Um, I think there needs to be a sort of growing library of New Zealand um, specific details around rattle spaces that we sort of share as a library to help help each other design these better buildings. What we've got in the guidelines is um, requirements for testing around the exits where you're coming out of fire exits where you're going to be escaping the building that we've got to have rattle space details that we're not all just sitting in the office making up that look like they're going to work ones that actually, um, as we always find out when we put things in the lab, that actually work um, under real movements which um, you can't always predict from static calculations and diagrams. Um, rattle space position up on site 9 with the rattle space at high level ground floor, certainly a lot of challenging detailing we work, th work through with the architect, trying to create resilience so you can, so these occupiers, these tenants at the top of the building who've paid for that resilience in the design and in their rents to justify the additional cost of the building um, so that they can still transition through the isolation plane in the stairs with these large movements. So, um, you know, certainly a lot of head scratching and whiteboard marking to try and get that working. Services integration, we found the services consultants really coming on board with a, a traditional rattle space, you know, where it's at one level and you've got a solid thing in the ground, you've got a flexible connection and then you join to the building and thou shalt not cross um, without going uh, with, a, with a flexible connection. Um, we found they really got their heads around that. Where it was a lot harder was Site 9 where you've got kind of things stuck to the underside moving with the building and then you've got services on the top of the ground floor that are servicing the ground floor and you have to try and keep space between that and making sure all the connections happen in the right space. So a little bit more challenge in geometry to try and explain and work through that as design teams. And suddenly through the facade, as Rowan said earlier, you know, the building has to be watertight every day. 
um, and earthquakes don't don't happen that often. So it's really important to get um, facade detailing that um, that is watertight but can be repaired after earthquakes. So it's not necessarily a no damage. Sometimes a low damage rather than a no damage solution is better in terms of its architectural performance. So some summary slide. Um, have we done good design? I guess we, we like to ask ourselves these questions. Um, we feel all three buildings with the stiff moment frames on site nine and the, and the rigid frames on the other two, um, we think we've created very well isolated buildings. We've got quite, um, we've played with the softness of our bearings and we've created stiff superstructures so we're getting that good separation between the ground period, the isolation period and the buildings period. And so um, we're hoping that the, the likelihood of resonance there is reduced. Um, Question before, are we trying to, are we spending too much time and money and analysis time trying to predict the hazard? Um, you know, if we'd spent some of that time and money on extra non-structural details and improving the low damage detailing in the building, would, it, would that actually be a better building? That's a bit of an open question. Um, so really with the guidelines we feel they're really, really good starter. There's some really good material in there. We've found some things as we've worked through them. Um, we'd like some thought amongst the um, the New Zealand community on how we actually get these rolled out to be um, uh, finalised guidelines um, and then that implies updates which um, is quite interesting because we've designed uh, a bunch of buildings to the draft guidelines as they've evolved. Um, as soon as you update them you can't then ask, oh are we actually designed for the latest guidelines which we've all found through the earthquake road, road building um, process. Um, so there's always a danger of updating them too regularly, but you do want to capture the best science. So there's a there's a delicate uh, balancing act there. Um, and really, we feel that um, uh, it's going to be a bit provocational here. That 1170 is kind of the elephant in the room. It's it's really um, 20 to 40 year old kind of technology, kind of kind of keeping up in terms of the words and the limits and that sort of thing in there. Like we are going for these low damage buildings. Um, we are all kind of, we think most of the officers are using some forms of displacement based design and thinking about other metrics which really aren't captured by 1170 anymore and um, especially you know, non-linear spectra, the scaling of 5% of dam spectra and things like that. Um, so um, it's our suggestion that it's really time for a major overhaul of 1170 if we really want to be pushing these low damage buildings and making it easier for designers to do it so we don't have to do these complicated analysis. Why can't 1170 be a better cut for with some loads and some displacements that are really simple that we can spend all the time make designing better buildings on the on the drawing board, so to speak, rather than um, rather than at the analysis machine. And that's us. Thank you, Alistair and Roland. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, can I please ask? all of the presenters and to David and, and to Joe to join us now. Um, I know that we're running um, fairly late but that's right. Um, there's been lots of really interesting discussion and, and a lot of questions um, have come up. In fact so many that I think what we should do is focus on a few of them and then I think the others we'll probably send out with the um, recording afterwards um, with, and try and answer them, particularly the more technical ones, in a separate right. way so that we don't, because I don't think we're going to have time to, to cover all of these questions. But I think there's some really interesting things and it ties in very much with Alistair's last, latest comments and I'd like both David and Alistair and Rowan to comment on Dean's question which I which I interpret to, to mean that how do designers keep the principles of capacity design um, while designing using, you know, using some of these innovative um, damping systems and design approaches and I just was interested to get your, both of your present, presenters comments on that, the idea of connecting the dots between the capacity design principles that are in our code um, and we don't have MCE as an explicit statement in our codes at the moment, as we all know, um, unlike the United States. And how do we how do we think about these things? And so um, maybe who wants to start? Is that for you, Alistair and, and Rowan, or is it David that wants to start with that? Um, I've got some opinions on that. So um, I think. Uh, 
it's kind of, it's nice to have an MCE there as a level. Um, my my fear of making it too entrenched is people like to go to it and analyse it at, thinking it's a real thing. Like all it is is supposed to be a means of robustness. So some of these systems like to like the ones that David ran through that we've done some similar press buildings. Like they've got a capacity way beyond that, and you've got to look at the mechanisms that are actually going to cause failure. And do they actually cause failure? Like if you post tensioning strand stretches a little bit, it won't be as effective, but you've still got further displacement capacity over you know three, four, five percent. You know, so you're not um, you can design buildings that can go way beyond MCE if you have a good system. And I guess one of my fears of having an MCE is people design something that's got a certain travel to MCE and then it stops. So um, we've done that with some of our isolation systems. There's a question about Site 9 and the travel there. So it's the question, how much robustness do you put beyond that to make sure you, you can sleep at night in terms of, you know, is there going to be a bigger earthquake? Have we created a robust system? So I think really drawing the building leaning over at 4% if it's conventional or, or going to a, a MCE type uh, displacement or a bit more is good for an isolated building. David, do you have any comments about capacity design principles when you're doing these sorts of interesting designs? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's like our version of statics, that, that it needs to be um, kind of fundamental to what you're doing. Um, I, I think one of the challenges we have sometimes with, um, we, can, we can think about um, uh, failure in terms of components. I, I, I think the Alistair's comment about tendons stretching, you know, I think there's an issue of, of um, what happened to the building and what's the consequence of the building. And under an MCE, I think we can take liberties, but we really under, need to understand the consequence so that, so that, um, so that safety is robust, but um, we can lose, you know, components can get really, really beat up. And so what I'd hate to have is an analytical solution that barely works and then uh, a year later, a geotech changes a attenuation relationship, and suddenly your design doesn't work anymore. And and so that that doesn't make any that doesn't make any sense. I, I really support this idea of being able to to understand your buildings based on hand calcs. Also, um, it, you know, there's a certain sensibleness uh, that that we need to employ and, and not get tripped up with our um, our our with the fussy analysis too much. Thank you, David. Um, thanks, David. Um, yeah, I'm going to pick up a couple of the questions on dampers, and I think we can probably um, join these together. So um, one of them is about uh, the, the dampers look like they're completely cast within the slab. Um, and oh, my things just jumped. There we go. Yeah. Uh, so how is maintenance inspection and checking post-earthquake allowed for? Um, and then I think one of the higher voted uh, questions was around what is the certification for dampers and does it have to be uh, used in a real life project? Mm, okay. Uh, hey, Jeff, do you mind answering the certification question first? Because you know better than I do. Right, so that was, um, <laughs> it was done against the a range of clauses in ASCE uh, 7, chapter 18 of that, a whole list of. Um, Points there, and that was also um, had to undergo through undergo peer review as well. So I think um, I think from memory. Um, Sorry, Jeff, you might just need to speak up just a little bit, please. I think just the, the life safety objectives were actually met without the dampers, and it was more about damage control. But it still went through all the certifications against uh, ASC seven and also through peer review. Okay, it's just a little quiet, but that that, that was it. Um, yeah, we we followed. So Jeff, to, to, just to we followed ASC seven, and um, there was uh, I guess there was a. a um, well, could you just repeat it, but get much closer to your mic? So um, it was the there's a list of conditions within uh, ASC seven. There's chapter eight themes on the use of damping devices. Um, there's, there's requirements on cycle-to-cycle -cycle variability and peak and average forces. There's enclosed area regulations, and that was all part of a part of the uh, re peer review process, which was done by Greg Dealine at Stanford. Thanks. 
And then on the questions of, of access, so we have um, the ability to uh, remove the damper um, by uh, – we, we, can, we can go into the, the, the top of the mat slab and remove it. It's, it's not – it's got a shroud around it, so there's no concrete touching it. It's actually in a void. And so we developed a system where you can um, unscrew the top um, and, and pull it out if we need to. Thank you all. Um, I was going to ask, there's a, there's a bunch of questions in the collection. Um, in the inevitable topic that keeps coming up with respect to anything designed in Wellington, we're rather interested in floor systems. And so just to keep everybody informed, um, can both... Actually, there's questions about David and the floor system that you used in the building in San Francisco, too. But just, Alistair and, and Rowan, can you just tell everybody what the floor systems were that you used for the various buildings? And, and also, David, because it, floor systems, as we all know, are rather a hot topic here at the moment. So let's just clarify that for everybody while, before we go on. Um, so all three of our buildings are, are Comfloor and steel beams, so no, no precast concrete, uh, no, none of the same ways as um, some of the other systems. The low, the low drift buildings anyway, so you know, there was an ability to use precast, but we were trying to keep the buildings light um, for, for different reasons on the different sites. And for our, for our buildings, the concrete buildings are cast in place. Um, Nice. Um, there's a little bit of precast going on out, out here, but but the custom place is more prevalent at this point. Thank you. Uh, I think that's really helpful because it is a topic that keeps coming up, isn't it? Um, the other thing that keeps coming up, and there are many technical questions in here, but I think we'll try and pack those and focus those Given the shortness of time, I realise we're running over time now, and we'll we'll provide some ask the presenters if they can provide some brief written comments, perhaps on those. But there is a question that keeps floating in a variety of these questions too about contractor competency and buildability. And while it's we've got real challenges sometimes with with getting um, contractor. Getting the construction that we design actually built, and any comments you have, anybody about um, challenges you might have had in that area or approaches that you've taken to address those sorts of challenges would be very interesting. Um, well, from the from the U.S. perspective, I do think this is um, a, an, a, a big important issue, and um, I've, I've, I have to admit, I'm guilty of sometimes designing Swiss watches, um, where, where you know, I can think of something that's really clever and I can detail the hell out of it. Um, and as I get older, I, I keep thinking it's like, I, you know, that that the need to like simplify and make things um, almost like bulletproof and more robust to, to error and layout problems becomes more and more compelling. Like I'm tired of. Of of of, um, of 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 fixing screw ups, so um, so I so I think as I get older I get more humble about stuff like that, um, and I also get uh, I, I really like the comment about spending time on the on the drawings. Um, I, the I, I spend more time um, like spelling everything out in the detail details, drawing more details, adding more dimensions. Um, I, I just it, it's kind of like I'd rather invest that time than than um, than spend it later at the tail end of it, because um, it's just really painful uh, at during construction to fix things. Even if you're right, it's really painful. Like you, you're just gonna you, you're gonna lose no matter what. So better head it off in the beginning. Simplify designs, more room and foundations. We completely agree. What's quite interesting about some of our diagrid structures. Um, was the investment by one of the maiden Wellington local steel contractor on a 3D mill that came out of aerospace. So 
for the um, for the diagrids, what we've been doing is almost backwards from what you normally do when you build a structure. You set it out and then you move the structure to its design place. If we were milling all the end plates, both on the nodes and the members, we were letting the structure find its own way and then checking that it got to where we thought it had, which is almost backwards from normal. And now that we're with the computer control gear, you've got that in some, some cases. So I think I completely agree with David on, on the watchmaking thing. We've certainly done that with some of our crest and rocking buildings in the past. I think that applies to 90% of the cases, but I think there's some interesting places where we can use our, our modern technology to help set out our buildings for us. So um, I think we're all trying to find where what, what's good in that space yet. I think we're still experimenting. I think, thank you so much. I think it's a really interesting comment you're making, um, and it is a real, ch I agree, it's a real challenge. I know that it's now 1.45 and we're running horribly late, but um, we did want to get through at least some of the questions. Um, I think, though, now we might have to close. So I'd like to thank um, all the presenters and Joe, who has um, ably chaired this session with us, as well as been providing amazing sponsorship support. Um, so thank you all, and, and watch the space. We've got another uh, webinar coming up in a couple of weeks' time on insurance matters, which will be also a fascinating topic. But and like I'd like to close now. So thank you all, and we'll see you again in two weeks' time.